Hello, good afternoon, friends. Uh, this is Kamar Sharma. I have with me uh, the entire top management team. Uh, I have Nilesh uh, Gupta, uh, Rajiv Sibal, Naresh Gupta, uh, Arvind uh, Botra, uh, Investor Relations. I have Rajiv uh, Pillay, uh, Ramesh Swaminathan, Vinita is here, and we have Sunil uh, uh, Makaria with us. Uh, you already have seen the results for the quarter. Uh, I think it's a very uh, unhappy situation for us. Uh, we are not happy at all with the results. But uh, the real-life situation is such that while we had been, uh, you know, uh, contemplating that, you know, things are not going well with the generic business in U.S., there have been some uh, surprises which were beyond us. Uh, aside from that, Japan has not turned out well because the volumes have gone up, but the Yaka cut has depressed value performance in that uh, place. Having said that, uh, there has been good performance in India, both formulation and API. Uh, Germany has done well. South Africa has done very well. But obviously the salience which U.S. and Japan have in our overall uh, business uh, tells on the results, as you would have seen. Uh, though, you know, going forward, I think uh, looks like uh, situation is going to be uh, similar for a few more quarters. Uh, we have some green shoots in the second uh, half of this year, uh, but a lot better performance from next year's second half. That's what we uh, see today. And uh, hopefully uh, some of the other efficiency improvement measures will also add to value creation. With that, I'll hand it over to our uh, CFO, Mr. Swaminathan, to take you through the details. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. So friends, uh, whilst we are disappointed with the results, uh, we do believe that better days are ahead of us, at least at least in the second quarter. Um, I did speak to a lot of investors over the last uh, few, uh, you know, since yesterday afternoon, and the questions hovered around our run rate in the U.S. and our, and our overall uh, margins itself. So I just want to clarify that uh, at the outset. When it comes to the U.S., uh, we, uh, you know, there has been a decline in, uh, in our overall turnover. Uh, and some people did comment about the fact that it was for the first time it is less than $200 million. Uh, I just want to clarify that this is essentially because of three things. The first was because of uh, the Metagene uh, franchise itself has eroded a bit. The second is because of uh, uh, our brand. Uh, oh, yeah, of course, the flu season, of course, is over, and Tamil flu and other anti infectives are over. And Metagene had gone generic as, you know, from a brand status that we enjoyed for some time. But having said that, we do believe that the second quarter, the, the quarter to come would certainly be much better. The second half would be much better in terms of, uh, because of the launches that we uh, bring to the market it includes for sure liver thyroxine. Uh, we also would be looking at Anexa. And we do believe that second resolve would certainly ramp up. So for that reason, I think, um, there, as Dr. Sharma was saying, be, there are quite a few green shoots in the offering. Um, and of course, in terms of the beta margins, we are aware, you must be aware of the fact that we are working with the world class consultants to actually ramp it up over time. So we're working on, this, on several initiatives, and we do believe all of this will certainly pay fruit over, over the next several quarters. With that, I would like to open this floor for discussions. Yeah. Sure, thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have the first question from the line of Sion Mukherjee from Nomura Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, so the quarter-on-quarter -quarter fall in the U.S., what do you think is the largest factor? You mentioned about, you know, three, four factors, products which have come down. But what is the largest contributor uh, to this fall this quarter? So, Sam, the largest uh, um, contributor was really Tamiflu. I mean, we had an opportunity in uh, Q4, uh, so the, in the previous quarter, to uh, get some upside on Tamiflu because we got approval just in the nick of time before the flu season closed and there was a shortage in the marketplace. Uh, so we leveraged that uh, on uh, some, um, uh, you know, one-time uh, uh, good price buys. 
Um, and that is why the you know, business has picked up significantly between Q3 and Q4 last year. So the biggest part of it is really time and flu, uh, followed by uh, the metformin uh, volume uh, decline that we have seen in the last two quarters uh, after metformin uh, lost its preferred uh, um, formulary status um, on uh, PBMs. And the third is, uh, as uh, Ramesh mentioned, uh, methagene going generic. So we had the confluence of, um, you know, both in the generic side of the business as well as the brand side of the business, um, the impact of uh, the decline in uh, the, the metformin franchise uh, in terms of uh, the market volume as well as uh, the flu product uh, uh, drop-off and uh, methagene going generic. Okay. That's helpful. And now since, you know, the competitive pressure on methogene and metformin are likely to continue, uh, so this base will therefore go down further before we get the impact of new launches. Is that a right statement to make? I would expect it to be at a very similar level in uh, Q2, um, actually, you know, because uh, uh, while we have, uh, um, you know, the, the volume of uh, the metformin products has uh, come down uh, quite a bit, um, you know, we, we expect marginal decline going forward. It will still be uh, declining, we expect, just given the formulary status. Uh, but uh, with the products that uh, uh, we have uh, in our portfolio now, I mean, Tamiflu, for example, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have... Uh, any revenue out of time of flu in this quarter in Q1, but Q2 onwards, uh, and in particular Q3, Q4, we expect uh, the product to ramp up. Likewise, uh, other product approvals, I mean, we had Axeron that got, got approved um, in this quarter, but uh, we were able to get commitments only at the end of the quarter, so we would expect that to contribute. So I would expect uh, Q2 to be at a similar level and then uh, pick up in Q3 and Q4. Okay. And Vinita, uh, lastly, would you like to give any guidance for the U.S. business uh, this year, given all the volatility uh, currently we are seeing? Yeah, so, you know, as we have shared even at uh, our investor meet in the last quarter, um, um, you know, uh, everyone had asked uh, um, uh, where would we expect the business uh, to grow, and we said uh, we, we would be lucky if the business grows. Um, you know, our endeavor is to try to really uh, maintain it as closely as possible at the last year's uh, uh, level, but, um, I mean, we see challenges in achieving it. Yeah. Any, any specific uh, decline number that you would like to highlight? I think it's going to be around the 800 to 850 mark uh, at this stage. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you, and I'll join back the queue. Thanks. Thank you very much. We take the next question from the line of Rehan M. from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Neha. Uh, Ma'am, uh, if you could throw some color on the Solosec launch and how we expect that to uh, ramp up. Yeah, Neha, it's been a, uh, an excellent launch, uh, very, very encouraging um, uh, response from the marketplace. Uh, we have uh, data now for the last uh, six weeks, and week after week, uh, the scripts have ramped up very nicely, ahead of our expectations, in fact. Uh, still early days, but a uh, very promising start to the product. Uh, we've uh, also uh, seen very little in terms of uh, um, uh, you know, resistance or reluctance for physicians and uh, the nurse practitioners to write the product, uh, so they have uh, the reception to the product has been very strong, uh, and um, the formulary coverage that uh, our team has been able to um, uh, get us uh, has also been very promising. When we launched the product, we had 50% coverage on commercial plans. At this point, it's at 68%, and our target is uh, to be at 80% plus by the end of this year. So. Um, I'd say that, uh, you know, given the momentum uh, right now, uh, we believe that uh, uh, we, should, uh, we should be able to uh, exceed our internal expectations of the product. But again, it's early days. And what could be the, you know, peak sales ramp up that we can uh, expect from this product? Uh, I know that, you know, probably you, you did mention that this could be larger than Metrogene, but, you know, uh, what is the peak sales that uh, Solasec could see? I think we have said that it has the potential of taking 25% of the market uh, in peak sales in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, 
you know, uh, the market, if you look at it, at uh, our, uh, uh, our net price for the product, uh, which is around $170, I mean, it's over a billion dollar market. So significant mm-hmm. potential. We're trying to get to it as soon as we can, uh, but uh, making sure that uh, we build it up uh, in the right way into the market. Uh, and the uh, second uh, related to Solosec, uh, is some amount of expense related to Solosec in the quarter, or should we expect a large part of it to start flowing through from the second quarter? No, we have a good part of the expense already in the quarter. I mean, uh, the um, Salesforce cost, I mean, we had a lot of uh, marketing expense, um, in fact, in this past two quarters, and then the Salesforce expense ramped up within Q1. So we'll now have the marketing expense uh, fall a little bit because a lot of the investments on the marketing front were, uh, you know, uh, for launch. Uh, but the sales force uh, expense uh, will now uh, continue, you know, quarter after quarter. Okay. Uh, so my last question. So, you know, given that this quarter had a large part of the solo sec expense, um, you know, we have seen a good improvement quarter on quarter, or even if I compare the last two quarters, in terms of maintaining, uh, you know, uh, other expenses. Is it fair to assume that, you know, the cost-saving initiatives that we were talking about, et cetera, is part- reflected uh, to some extent, or there is more scope for improvement in the uh, expense run rate? You know, I think when it comes to cost, uh, there has been some impact because of, in fact, uh, procurement prices in China, you know, pro- procurement of, uh, of inputs from China going up, but that's been marginal. Uh, when it comes to the initiatives that we spoke about, uh, these are ongoing, but uh, it would be some time before the, the fruits really uh, are visible, perhaps in the third or fourth quarters and, and thereafter. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anubhav Agarwal from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Uh, Vinit, what was the brand says this quarter? $22 million. How much? $22. So it was $12, actually, 12, 12, 12, 12 million, million dollars with yeah. FSG in having gone generic. Yeah, it came down to roughly half. Versus it was 20 plus in the fourth quarter. That's the right. way to look at it. Okay. Yeah. And within that, yesterday, Apotex got approval under FDA's new CGT uh, uh, initiative. Uh, just wanted to check uh, for us, uh, uh, do we have any of our pipeline products, which can, which is right now almost 30 plus products FDA has under CGT right now, any of our product qualifies under that? Yeah, we have a few products that uh, we expect, uh, you know, could qualify under that. The big question is going to be, is anyone ahead of us in the race? But there are a number of products where we have priority right now. So among those 33 NDAs that FDA has classified under NDAs, you have some of them right now, yes. or in future you can have? No, no, we have some of them right now. Which we have filed. Which we have filed. Sure, that's helpful. And uh, uh, Ramesh, one question on IP income. We include, uh, we, we report almost like $30 million IP income, uh, which is about 50, 60 crore a quarter. Uh, I just wanted to have two questions on this. How many products does this $30 million annual IP income correspond to? IP income of thirty million dollars is not what you have. Year, you think? Yeah. 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 So we, we include in USA, right? Uh, license income or IP income are almost fifty, sixty crore a quarter, which is annualized roughly about thirty million dollars. Three million in a quarter. Anubhav, just give us a second. No, it's not uh, thirty million. Is never the figure that we ever did. We take it offline anyway. I think where I don't know where your question actually comes from. Okay, no, I just so US sales we report as one sixty eight million dollars. Yeah. Whereas the North American revenues we include as much higher, I always think yeah. that the difference between the two is the IP income that we report. And Canada as well. How much is Canada out of that? Canada is only about four million dollars. I'll take it. Four million dollars You'll per take quarter. It I'll take it. Four million per quarter. Anubha, we uh, we can take it offline. Sure, uh, you absolutely. can call me later. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. We will move to the next question. Next question is from Rakesh Shinjanwala from Rare Enterprises. Please go ahead. Hi. One thing I want to know is what is the non-recurring solicit expense of this quarter? Non-recurring expense. So about 10. Solicit would be potentially, you know, there would be, of course, this uh, huge ramp-up expense which would potentially come down over time. Um, but that's essentially because uh, that would be common when you actually launch a product in the U.S. So, Ramesh, you have a launch expense, no? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 
and those with that launch expense, some part is non-recurring, no? Yeah, I would say about 10 to 12 crores. 10 to 12 crores, not million. No. <laughs> and how is the pricing pressure in America now? Uh, so pricing uh, pressure, Rakeshi, is uh, uh, you know on the, the baseline. Older products uh, have come down to a high single digit, as uh, we have uh, witnessed. I mean, it's really uh, um, you know the newer products where you have uh, material additional entrant or exclusivity loss, where one sees a higher pricing uh, erosion, but otherwise a high single digit. So where prices are stabilized, they are stabilized. Where additional competition is coming. Yes. That used to happen earlier also, no? That's right. And uh, one question more I had. What happened to Edwin and all those respiratory products? So Edwin is still in the development, Rakeji. I mean, we have made significant progress on um, uh, Sariva, which, is, uh, which was the second DPI that we were pursuing, um, you know, post our uh, filing. Uh, we also got the confirmation that uh, we are first to file on that product. Uh, so we are uh, uh, pursuing that one with the FDA right now. And uh, on ProAir uh, as well, uh, um, we have uh, uh, qu questions that the FDA has raised that uh, uh, we believe we can respond uh, effectively. So we're in the process of responding to them, and uh, uh, we believe we'll be on track to launch the product uh, next, next fiscal year as, as we had planned. Uh, so the two products that are already filed, uh, ProAir should... Uh, come to market next year. And then we have uh, um, seven other products that are in various stages of development. Do you think you will be able to launch Adware next year? Not Adware, ProAir. Pro Pro How big is that a product? It's a $3 billion product. A lot of competition? Or? There are a few competitors. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next question is from Anik Mitra from SMIFS. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, ma'am, uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, in Braille. Uh, can, can, you, can you, uh, regarding in Braille, in Braille, one is uh, uh, like, uh, I just want to know the revenue part of in Braille in Japan and what is with the status of uh, launch of Inbrail in Europe? So we have, uh, as you know, we have partnered with Nichiko in Japan and Mylan for Europe and certain other markets. We expect uh, both our partners to launch in the next fiscal year, uh, probably Nichiko a little bit earlier than Mylan. Um, so we expect uh, Nichiko maybe in the first quarter and uh, Mylan uh, in the second or third quarter. Um, and, you know, so we would expect uh, at least half year of uh, uh, revenues, um, you know, uh, next next fiscal year, uh, both in Japan as well as Europe. Okay, uh, ma'am. One more from my side. Uh, uh, what is the margin, uh, profit margin, uh, in your domestic business as well as in international business? We don't share that um, figure uh, with anybody. <laughs> but in a general sense, you would say that the you know the uh, Margin in India is uh, slightly above the corporate average, whilst the highest contributing region historically has been the U.S. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, one more. Uh, like, uh, what is the tentative uh, date of approval for Nilasta and uh, Lucentis? So we've not uh, filed either of them at this uh, at this point of time. Um, we are hoping mm -hmm. to file Nilasta next year. And, uh, and then be approved in a year, year and a half after. Um, next, year, next year means, are you, are you referring next quarter, uh, uh, next fiscal? Yes, FI20. FI20, we expect to file, and then hopefully uh, late FI21, we should get approved. Um, and uh, on Lucentis, we're still reviewing what to do with the product. Okay, okay, okay fine, thank you. Th that is helpful. Thank you for that. Thank you. Next question is from the line of P. Rangamai, who's an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, team. Uh, I uh, think the quarter uh, EBITDA margin for uh, Q1 is about uh, 13 percentage, and uh, I believe the management has guided for 18 to 20 percentage uh, guidance for FY19. 
so how is this going to come from? I think um, it really is your perspective because essentially we reckon other income also when it comes to EBITDA margins. Taking that off I think is not fair because the huge chunk is essentially coming in from Forex which is part of Forex, you know, which is essentially, an, uh, you know, it's part of the business itself. The other part is essentially settling, settlement income and other IP related uh, stuff which is something that's part of the pharmaceutical business. So knocking it off from, from in fact, uh, you know, EBITDA margins is not, a, uh, it's not a good thing at all from our perspective. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Chirag Dagli from HDFC Asset Management. Please go yeah, ahead. sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Sir, what what volume share does uh, what volume share does Q1 reflect for Methergy? Roughly around fifty percent. Fifty percent. All right. And uh, the Gavis write-off that we've done last year, is this um, uh, largely for the dermatology pipeline or for the controlled substances pipeline, the $225 million that we wrote off last year? It is actually for, uh, you know, for a host of products. You know, so, uh, entire pipeline. It's the entire pipeline that we have bought. Yeah, so we took uh, a realistic assessment on what we thought the potential was and uh, uh, decided that we'd just take a one-time write-off. Uh, yes, so it is not, uh, you know, more towards dermatology or controlled substances either? No. No. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next question is from Surya Patra from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, for this one, uh, can you repeat one thing? What was the brand driven, uh, sir? Can you repeat it? Can you repeat it? $12 million. $12 million, okay. Uh, and uh, now on the uh, U.S. business front, so after seeing, so this year also looks uh, relatively sequential decline. Uh, so that means it is a cumulatively two years of a decline that we are witnessing. So going ahead, what is, uh, uh, though we have already indicated about the few products which will be driving, but uh, what is the general outlook one should be having for the U.S. business for this year and next year? As I mentioned, uh, this year, uh, uh, while uh, the first half of the year is challenging, uh, we expect uh, to uh, see a pickup um, in the second half uh, 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 due to uh, the, both the flu products, uh, you know, like Tamiflu and other flu products that we have in our portfolio, as well as uh, new product launches, uh, like the material ones, uh, Renexa, as well as Levothyroxine. Um, and then uh, on the brand front, uh, of course, the Solosec uh, pickup that we expect uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to to see, uh, you know, quarter after quarter should really have a, a, a material impact, again, at least for the year in the second half. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, outlook for next year, as we mentioned, uh, we expect, uh, uh, you know, Solosec to ramp up nicely this year, so it would be a significant contributor uh, next year on the brand side of the business. On the generic side of the business, uh, we would continue to see uh, um, an upside from uh, Renexa, at least uh, for uh, the initial part of the year. Uh, and then uh, later half of the year, we should see upside both from ProAir as well as uh, Eternocept. Okay. And uh, this Eternocept, how influenced this could be? Let me correct myself. Eternocept is obviously not the U.S. Um, Okay. I was referring more towards the complex generic uh, business pickup, uh, which is uh, going to be primarily uh, uh, ProWare and uh, Eternacept. And uh, is it possible to say what is the commercial agreement for the Eternacept and uh, how influential this revenue could be next year? Uh, any sense um, on this? Yeah, so we have uh, a very, uh, very good terms, you know, given that we uh, invested uh, in developing the product uh, all the way uh, through clinical trials. Obviously, uh, we took majority of the risk, and uh, therefore the commercial terms reflect that. We have a good percentage of the upside. Uh, so it should be uh, a significant. Uh, uh, we have just half year, or maybe uh, three fourths of the year for uh, Japan, and half year for uh, Europe. But uh, the year after, uh, we expect it to be a significant contributor as a product to the company. Okay. And this last one question on the uh, overall margins is how do the three home markets that we have, like 
US, Japan and domestic Indian market, formulation market. So two are like US and Japan are seeing a sequential decline in some time. So then, so what margin reverse that you have for the subsequent period then? You know, uh, the margin itself is a function of three things. The kind of products that you bring to the market and that's, that's a realization spend. The second yeah. is essentially your R&D spend. And third, of course, is uh, you know the, on the cost front and the kind of uh, initiatives that we take on that. Uh, on the on the realization front, we've got quite a few good products lined up, uh, you know, which is obviously going to be over time. Uh, this particular year, we're looking at at least a couple of products. But next year, for example, we're looking at Proair, and then there is going to be Steriva, a host of uh, you know uh, the complex injectables coming up and, and the like. And there's of course the as well, which is uh, it is obviously going to be a good uh, uh, contributor to the margins. When it comes to, in fact, uh, you know, if the R&D spends, you know, we've been trying to put a, you know, uh, keep it as, as low as possible, and this particular quarter you would depreciate that is just about 10%. It's, it's again a function of two things. Uh, you know, we are increasing the productivity of, in fact, the uh, people associated with R&D, and the second part is essentially uh, we're also tied up with, in fact, the financial investors who take away the risk from us whilst, uh, you know, we share with the, in, in the upside when we get to launching the product itself. And that lowers the overall R&D spends in our books. When it comes to the cost initiatives, obviously this uh, it, it's something that has been going on for quite some time. We've taken it uh, in waves. There's been uh, initiatives on the on the procurement front. There's been initiatives on labor rationalization using MOST techniques and the like. There is uh, excellence on the operational front, and so on. All of this have contributed in the past and will continue to do so. There's of course a fresh leash of uh, leash of initiatives that we'll be bringing on, uh, uh, you know, in, in due course with uh, top-notch consultants, and all of this will also bear fruit. So we do believe that there is scope for improvement on that front, and this is a continuous endeavor. Okay. So what is the higher amount that is there in the other income this quarter? So there are two parts to that. There's, of course, one portion which is relating to Forex. The other is, of course, settlement income, and both we believe are uh, part of the overall business itself. Okay. Can you please quantify Forex gain in at least? Yeah, it's um, around the 150 crore mark this particular quarter. Okay. Thank you, sir. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Next question is from Ashia Anand from Allegro. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just the first question was on uh, Atanasep. Uh, you indicated a launch second half FI 19. Uh, Mylin yesterday on the webcast kind of guided for... Uh, Second half CY 18 approval. So just trying to understand any reason why the launch could happen earlier? Um, well, we filed the product in Europe only in uh, April of this year. So we expect the approval to take at least one year. Um, so, um, you know, uh, we'll be happy to see the product in the market uh, <laughs> in the current calendar year. But it probably will be only in markets that do not uh, require um, uh, a long uh, lead time. Uh, the major markets will really open uh, next next year, next fiscal year. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, secondly, on Spiriva, uh, just to understand your outlook on potential litigation and our outlook on when we could potentially launch this product? Yes, yeah, so we have it uh, slated for uh, uh, fiscal year 22 launch right now, uh, but we are taking a look at uh, our uh, patent position to see if we can accelerate it. Okay, excellent. And... Um, you know, they have a lot of questions around the margins. So I'm just trying to understand, is it possible to give some kind of an outlook on what margins could look like on the second half once we actually get the benefit of levothyroxine and uh, the next sign numbers? I think for the full year, uh, we're still looking at uh, a range between 18 and 20%. Uh, on EBITDA. You know, on EBITDA. On EBITDA. On EBITDA. Uh, that's the EBITDA margin that you're speaking about. Okay. And... Um, would FI twenty uh, would FI twenty kind of could we see a boost on that or, or is eighteen twenty percent EBITDA including other income kind of the new normal we should look at? You know, next year we do have ProAir coming in for us, and that will certainly contribute significantly. The other part is essentially you know the newer initiatives that you're speaking about. Um, some of those would uh, we would carry it through fruition. So to the extent that there would be a, you know there would be of course a benefit of that coming through next year as well, especially in the second half. Okay, excellent. And if 
you could just uh, ask one last question. Uh, just want your outlook on the competitive scenario on Renexa and Levothyroxine, say, uh, as we go into FI20 and as Renexa go, uh, gets out of exclusivity. Uh, Yes, yeah, so after it goes, uh, um, we uh, are done with the exclusivity period, we expect a few other competitors, at least um, as we um, see uh, the competitive landscape right now. On uh, levothyroxine, um, um, as well, we would expect, uh, um, you know, a couple additional uh, competitors by uh, fiscal year 20. So I would think that uh, there will be uh, six, seven players in the market. In levothyroxine? That's right. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks a lot for the answers. Thank you. The next question is from Samir Vaisuwala from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Visa, did I hear you correctly? You mentioned net price on SoloSec 170? That's right. Okay, and I would, uh, I, I think the VAC price or list price is about 270? That's right. So the net price is after all of our, uh, um, you know, our rebates to uh, managed care, as well okay. as our funds. Okay, but is it uh, not out of ordinary to have a branded product at such a steep uh, rebating? Uh, not, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, especially in the, um, the launch uh, time uh, period when you are uh, trying to build access. To the product, uh, and so we have a good level of couponing as well that is built into that number. So it's a combination of rebating as well as uh, uh, coupons. Okay. With given that, uh, means that you are almost close to 70% uh, formulary listing. Now, what are the key, um, you know, uh, milestones or key challenges that will take you up to 25% market share? <laughs> Um, so the biggest one that we expected even uh, pre-launch was pricing, and that's why uh, you know we, we uh, uh, spent a lot of time uh, trying to determine what uh, the VAC price as well as uh, the discounts and coupon strategy ought to be. Uh, we're seeing good level of uh, uptake right now. We haven't seen any um, disconnect so far. So it's really, uh, uh, at this point, it is all about execution in our uh, our managed care team has really uh, put uh, uh, us in a very strong position from an access perspective and will continue to build on that. Um, so it's really how much of a share we can switch from uh, Flagell at this point, which our team is, uh, you know, um, they, they've started off on a very strong note. Okay, so now it's all about moving to doctor's chamber and getting more and more prescription filled. Is that, is that where it moves to? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, the IMS is reflecting about uh, seven, eight hundred prescriptions a week now. How do you see this trend up by the end of this year and next year? Yeah. So we expect it uh, to go up uh, week after week. Obviously, uh, you know, in the next couple of quarters, we hope to end up uh, this uh, fiscal year at an exit share of between four to five percent. Okay, which is uh, four to five thousand prescriptions, I presume. Uh, I just uh, four to five percent market share is um, um, is what um, I was referring to. Yeah, I was con converting that into prescription as well. So, but the sign. Okay, and the second question is on Proair um, on Arbitrol. Uh, you said FD has given you some queries. So, is this um, a CRL or is this a post TAD, which was expected sometime now? No, it's a CRL. Okay. Is it a major one, minor one, or? Uh, no, we um, are uh, in the process of uh, getting a response together and uh, expect to file uh, our response in the next month. Okay, great. Uh, great. And uh, on level, uh, I remember the TAD date was somewhere around this uh, this time. Uh, have we passed that, or? I think they moved it out by a couple of months. Okay. Okay, super. And this one, final one from my side on Enbrel. Um, uh, so, Nish, my understanding is a couple of things have to happen for you to get into European market. One is CHMP uh, approval, and the other is site inspection, which I presume should be a Pune facility. So, can you just uh, share some thoughts on that? Uh, 
Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, and because it's a clinical trial, they'll probably inspect uh, some of the clinical uh, sites and the like as well, some of which are actually beginning already. So, uh, yes, those are, uh, those are two of the big milestones that we need to hit before we bring the, uh, bring the product to market. Um, inspection of our Pune facility as well as uh, um, the approval itself. And when do you expect EMA to visit Pune? And has that facility ever been inspected by any regulated market regulator? Um, not by, uh, not by. Uh, in fact, we would expect uh, Japanese authorities to come in sooner, and then we would probably expect European authorities to come in. But by a regulated market uh, regulator, they've not come in so far. We've had a bunch of others, and we've been very successful. So obviously, we're preparing for those audits. We have regulators. We have regulatory expertise from both uh, Japan and Europe that's been uh, helping us in this process as well. Um, it, it's, a, it's a small, but it's a very good facility. So we're very hopeful that things should be, things should be good. We also had the advantage of uh, a number of our partners and potential partners that looked at uh, the product and the facility. Um, um, you know, really um, helped give us the confidence that uh, we are in a very good position. Okay, great. Thanks. I've got a few more. I'll get back in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Prakash Agarwal from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just first question on the the facility clearance. I mean, what is our thought and where are we, especially once we've cleared the European inspections uh, for both indoor and Goa? So, uh, um, as you know, we got the warning letter in November, and then we uh, submitted monthly updates to the FDA thereafter. In July, we submitted the last update to the FDA. We've taken care of all the, you know, specific observations that the FDA had to address in the warning letter. Parallel to that, we've also developed an overall enhancement plan. We've shared that with the FDA as well. That really is a multi-year plan in any case. Next step now is to is to connect with the FDA, likely meet with them. Um, share with them what we've done to date, um, and uh, following that would be a reinspection. And then, uh, you know, we talked earlier about uh, resolution by the end of the year. So, you know, my hope is that before the end of the fiscal, we should hopefully be able to clear both facilities. <coughs> Great. Good luck on that. And secondly, uh, uh, comments on gross margin. So clearly, you mentioned the, you know, U.S. Uh, high margin product and Japan. Uh, so uh, if you could give some color on the outlook of gross margins. I think uh, for the next few quarters, it's going to be kind of uh, at this rate only, uh, Prakash. It'll around, hover around the 60 to 62% mark. And go up in the, okay. and go up in the second half, so to speak. Okay, understood. And sir, on the Forex, as you said, it is an integral part. So we saw a very big jump in Forex this quarter. Uh, how do we foresee this uh, given uh, rupee dollar remaining constant here uh, for the next uh, couple of quarters? So uh, next quarter you might not uh, have the upside that you have seen this quarter, uh, but uh, we'll have newer products coming in towards the end of the uh, uh, towards the second half of the fiscal, and it will translate into the it will translate into the revenues itself. So obviously we've been looking at lower revenues at this point of time, so that will translate into some business gain. That's true. Okay, understood. And uh, on Emerald, uh, just trying to understand the milestone payment that we received, $15 million. I understand it's not been recognized. Uh, yeah. uh, first question on, so uh, so what is the market opportunity that we are looking that the milestone is uh, relatively smaller, $15 million? And secondly, uh, uh, you know, on, uh, so first one is on Emerald on this, please. Yeah, so the milestones, uh, the upfront milestone with uh, Milan was $15 million, so obviously the Nichiko was 6 and uh, we have other milestones as well uh, for uh, regulatory approvals and launch. Uh, so the um, additional milestones add up to a pretty pretty good size number, but our focus was really to try to get a good uh, percentage of uh, the upside. You know, we want long-term revenues out of the product, and that's, that's how we uh, decided to go after this kind of deal structure. So, I mean, do we model in 50-50 or is higher your share would be higher? I think 50-50 is a good assumption. Okay, understood. 
and lastly on levothyroxine so this is subject to facility clearance or this we have a, a, a you know a dris facility on this yeah no uh, we have a dris facility on this so it's not subject to uh, being indoor facility clearance perfect great thanks i'll join back with you thank you next question is from prashant nayar from city group please go ahead <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi. My question is Avinash. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next question. Next question is from Manoj Agarwal from BMI. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for my, uh, giving my question. Now you have just mentioned about the uh, Spiriva Genetics that you are the first to file company for Spiriva Genetics. Manoj, we can't hear you. Can you speak up a little bit? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. My question is on Spiriva Genetics. Ma'am, you have just mentioned about the. Uh, It's very direct file that you are first to file company. So have FDA given any target action that, or do you think when you can launch the product or get the approval for extra generic? Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, at present we think it's fiscal year 22, but uh, we have just started uh, the litigation process. So we'll see if we can accelerate it. Okay. And uh, about the target action date, uh, have the FDA mentioned any target action date? or are you comfortable enough to share the about the so information the action date actually we have a, uh, i don't recall the date uh, but right now the litigation itself is longer than the target action date yeah so we have a target action date we don't have it right now yeah. okay thank you thank you next question is from nitin agarwal from idfc securities please go ahead Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Vinita, on uh, Solosec, uh, so what is the competitive situation uh, from, from your perspective on the product as, uh, over the next couple of years? Um, you know, I don't uh, expect, um, um, you know, there are a couple of uh, smaller products that have, um, um, you know, uh, uh, have got some promotional effort recently, like Nuvesa that uh, excels a lot from uh, Allegan and uh, there are a couple of products in development. but nothing that uh, really has the kind of profile that solo solo tech does so from a competitive standpoint uh, you know um, we were pretty confident even through diligence that there's uh, nothing else that uh, comes close to the profile of solo tech and uh, in, in terms of uh, the brand usp uh, you know versus the current uh, maybe gen- generic all alternatives which are there uh, you know and what what would be your i mean what is the sort of milestone to sort of watch out there is it uh, which can give us uh, the kind of market shares uh, you know that we are aspiring for that we're aiming for i mean it's really consistent uh, ramp up of uh, share the new positions that uh, our team uh, is able to convert to solosec uh, the weekly ramp up in share and uh, that is what uh, we are tracking those are the milestones that we are tracking on a weekly and monthly basis and, and you believe Uh, by over the next two years, we should be able to hit the 25% uh, sort of market share levels. Well, uh, the 20-25% is really the peak uh, share, you know, um, that uh, we have planned for, and uh, we should see it in uh, three to four years. Okay. And lastly, on the R&D spends, uh, you know, we've we've done a fair job of calibrating R&D spends, and that's probably a challenge that the whole of the product industry is facing at this point of time, with uh, challenges on the top line growth. but you know uh, but from your perspective how much of uh, hindrance is it in terms of uh, in terms of creating uh, just at the time when you guys need to really ramp up spends on specialty and a whole lot of other stuff uh, i mean how much of a constraint is that uh, you know this, this need to control r and d spends yeah, so we have rationalized a lot of the r and d spend on the generic front uh, with all of the changes uh, in the generic industry and the competitive landscape um, you know uh, we determined that it doesn't make sense uh, to really pursue products where you're going to see uh, six seven eight eight players going forward um so that we, so we rationalize spend on the generic front uh, you know uh, in favor of products that have limited competition uh, you know like ventilation products uh, complex injectables and others um so this really helps us start creating room for specialty r&d spend as we start building a pipeline and so we are right now looking at uh, other uh, opportunities to add to our portfolio in our focus still is on late stage products that are uh, that have gone through uh, phase 3 trials but uh, there are some interesting opportunities also that 
um, you know, will require phase three studies that are phase two completed that we are looking at right now. So, so we certainly will not um, overlook opportunities that can really help us build our specialty business. Okay, thanks and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Dawayan Kikerai from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, coming back to FDA remediation, are we done with uh, most of the cost involved there, or uh, something more can come in uh, next few quarters? Yes. So the, you know the consultant fees and the like for the most part is done. Um, so some of it would would come into July as well. But with that we're done and. Uh, you know, there are certain investments we're making for the future, but that's much lesser than what we've incurred in the past. Okay, so majority of costs are already uh, been incurred, right? And uh, quantum should be lesser going ahead. Correct. Okay, okay. Uh, another question on Japan, like how should we look at that market and are we profitable in uh, Japan? So um, I, I think Japan is going through quite a transition at this point of time, um, you know, especially with the price cut and the, you know, you know, room for future price cuts as well. Um, it really is, you know, I think the world has to start looking at Japan as more a substitution-oriented market. Um, you have to question why you need a sales force. You need to see how you can bring R&D cost down, manufacturing cost down. So these are, you know, the, for us, but also for the rest of the industry, these are the same challenges that people are seeing right now in Japan. For our part, obviously, you know, uh, the move was how much more research we can do in India, how much more manufacturing we can do in India, what do we do with the sales force, um, but also the move to specialty. So we started with long-listed, but even long-listed products are not protected anymore. Um, so we have Bipresso, but the intention would be to do more of complex generics and specialty in Japan as well. So I think, you know, while Japan makes money, um, I think it's uh, going through quite a bit of transition. Um, we'll have to go through the pains of Japan for the next two years as it emerges into a more substitution-oriented market. Okay, and how much uh, manufacturing we do in India for Japan market right now, or it's entirely done here? No, no, so we, we do a significant part. We have three uh, facilities in Japan to manufacture. Um, but I would say about uh, about 10% of what we would uh, what we would sell is manufactured in India. Okay, thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you. Next question is from Abhishek Sharma from IIFS. Please go ahead. Uh, hello. Thanks for taking my question. I was just going through my one uh, QFI 18 notes, uh, which is one year back. Um, and at that point in time, we were talking about levothyroxine launch uh, uh, by the end of FI, uh, uh, end of 2017. And from there, we are, uh, you know, timeline has shifted by about 9 to 12 months. Uh, uh, broadly wanted to understand what has led to this delay. It's only the target action date moved out from, uh, from FDA's perspective. Uh, so we've been reading all this while, but the FDA has uh, uh, sort of delayed... Uh, Acting on uh, the file is so ready. Ready really has no meaning, right? In the sense that if FDA moves out the date, then they move out their entire review process as well. Whatever questions that they're asking you as well, so you really don't have uh, control on on that process. Um, parallel to that, we were also ramping up facilities for uh, that. We've actually been able to complete that ramp up. So I think if we got approved three four months ago, we would have had a challenge to be able to cater to the volumes. But now we have the uh, capacity to be able to take care of it also. And as TAD has uh, continued to shift uh, uh, from FDA side, they have uh, continued to raise fresh queries on the file? Or No, no I, so I think that the TAD can move irrespective of being asked uh, questions. We don't have any questions pending on levothyroxine at this point. Right. Uh, the other question was uh, around uh, capital deployment. I understand that you have a couple of... I mean, several long-ended uh, R&D uh, uh, initiatives going on for the U.S. market. But just from an incremental capital allocation or capital deployment perspective, what would be your uh, preference uh, in terms of geography? What would be the hierarchy? Is it U.S.? Is it India? Is it uh, opportunistic? Uh, just, just some uh, color there. So money should flow where the yield is the highest. And uh, as we all recognize, the U.S. is the most, uh, is, is the most paying market. But for sure, India is also equally important. And uh, so essentially, if the proposition is compelling enough, 
we would uh, deploy monies in India also. But the priority remains U.S. Yeah. Speciality in the U.S. certainly is going to be the priority. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Arpit Kapoor from IDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I just wanted to understand how would the ramp up be for Levo once we get an approval? So is it going to be like a normal generic where we'll get uh, uh, a target market share or is it going to be a slightly slower uh, ramp up? Um, I think it's going to be a slower ramp up um, because uh, there are, you know, there are multiple R&Ds that you need to be approved against as you as you sell the product. Um, anybody who files cannot file against three different R&Ds at the same time. So you have to file against one, get an approval for that, put supplements for follow-on uh, R&Ds as well, and then eventually be approved for the entire line. Uh, so I think the ramp up will be slower. And um, in that context, uh, given the guidance uh, that we are sticking to in terms of U.S. with $800 million of revenue or thereabouts, and with Vinita um, uh, suggesting in the call that the second quarter is also going to be uh, uh, somewhat flat on a QOQ basis, so what kind of ramp-up are we expecting in second half for us to uh, get to an $800 million U.S. sales for the full year? I think the seasonality um, element will play out in the uh, in Q3 and Q4, where you have products like Tamiflu coming back. You have the cephalosporin business picking up uh, more as well. Even products like azithromycin, which will sell uh, more. Obviously, Solosec is is ramping up at this point. Um, Levothyroxine, hopefully, and then obviously Renolazine. You know, I, I think in order, Renolazine, Solosec, and then probably Levothyroxine will be the growth drivers in the second half. And uh, last bit, uh, how much of our uh, EBITDA guidance of 18 to 20% is contingent on the fact that we get $800 million U.S. sales uh, for the year, for the full year, the guidance of 18 to 20%? It is to the extent, uh, you know, uh, it does depend on that, right? So um, our confidence levels for getting that figure is fairly high, and hence uh, the margin guidance of 18 to 20% also. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next question is from Sham Srinivasan from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Just a conceptual question on uh, biosimilar Enbrel. Uh, so when we look at it uh, next year, how would you look at the market opportunity? It's very large, clearly. But do you think, given the chronic conditions, will we be targeting new patients? Any, any color generally on commercialization strategies uh, will be useful. Thank you. So I, I think it's a little premature to share some of the deeper uh, commercialization strategies, but as far as Japan is concerned, as you know, um, there's one product that is already approved. We expect to be the uh, next product coming into the market. Um, so we'll be one of two or three players in Japan. Um, there are already approvals in Europe, so we'll be one of three or four approvals in, uh, in Europe. And uh, in many ways, the commercialization strategy would be similar to what people have already started in Europe or are going to start in Japan. So which is to target new patients. Uh, is, would that be the first target uh, population? Uh, I, I don't quite want to comment on that right now, but you know, typically it starts with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And my second question is on the India business. Uh, so we have uh, like for like, it's at 31%. How should we look at this business uh, for FI19? And uh, also the partnership with the uh, Boringer, right? Uh, can you just shed some light on that? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So India business, as we have mentioned earlier also, uh, that we will grow at 40 to 15 percent level. That is our guidance for the year. And we are pretty much there as far as that particular growth is concerned. I think the first quarter, because of the uh, first quarter of the last year, GST impact, the growth is more. But going forward, I think we will stabilize. Uh, but uh, on yearly basis, 14 to 15 percent growth, that is what we are looking for. And we are pretty much sure that we are uh, there as far as that growth is concerned. As far as VI partnership is concerned, I think we have done very good partnership as far as our oral, oral and diabetic drugs are concerned because diabetes therapy area is one of the most progressive therapy area in Indian pharmaceutical market. And we get almost 20% of our Indian business, India business from diabetes therapy area. So in that sense, it is a very, very significant partnership further uh, getting sent in. And we are very sure that since diabetes is very progressive, it will add to our overall growth as far as, uh, you know, our India business growth is concerned. So that gives us more confidence because our chronic presence is more. 
and chronic is the key driver of the market and that gives us more confidence that we will be at 14 to 15 percent growth as far as FI19 is concerned. It, uh, last question to Ramesh, just on tax guidance, it's, it's, we, is it still the 27 percent number, 27, 28? Yeah, this year, this quarter has been an aberration more because the fact that uh, you know, we, had, we had losses in, uh, in, 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 in a couple of subsidiaries and uh, there was of course this DTA wind down which has happened also. Uh, for the full year, I would imagine that the tax guidance be about 30 percent. Okay. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Next question is from Himesh Mehta from Research Delta Advisors. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, uh, based on levothyroxine, so are we likely to launch a branded product or a generic product? So we're targeting a generic product. Okay, so uh, there are other generics also in the market and they still have not been able to gain any market share. Do you think that the generic market share will increase, which is what will help us uh, also have a better penetration? Or how does it go? Uh, yeah, we, we are uh, trying to ensure that uh, we are substitutable to all of the three RLDs and uh, that's why it has taken us longer to get this product uh, to market. Uh, but uh, once we are, uh, you know, uh, FDA accepts that and approves us uh, as bioequivalent to all three RLDs, we would expect uh, a, a good level of switch. So what is holding back the current generic uh, companies in the market to gain market share? Not yeah, every company has mind. got uh, uh, a bio uh, study, uh, a bioequivalent study against all three RLDs. I'm sorry, you said no company has got the vehicle study that is on the three R and D? Not all the companies in the market have, uh, you know, uh, approved. But if, I, but, if, but if I read well, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, none of the generic prod, uh, companies, I mean, companies who launch generic version, have any meaningful market share. So even if that would also include companies who would have done bio studies against uh, all the three R and D, right? No, there are companies that have reasonable market share. Maybe you're comparing with uh, one particular RLD, but uh, for example, I know Mylan has a decent market share with the product. Okay, and they have have they done uh, bio studies against all the three RLD? I believe so. I mean, we can maybe confirm offline to you, you know, with uh, more detail from a pipeline group. Okay, fine, fine. Uh, the other thing I uh, just wanted to know is, uh, you know, the uh, impact of uh, this raw material price increase from China. What do you think is likely to be to us in coming quarters? Definitely because it's been pretty marginal in the first quarter, but we do believe that uh, if you take the full year, it is certainly uh, going to be uh, a significant amount. Uh, and we are also hearing of more environmental restrictions coming in from China. So I would think the days to come, uh, there is going to be some significant impact because of that. So what is our exposure as of now to uh, Chinese raw material? I mean, as a percentage of sales or percentage of total material cost, however you want to say. So typically we buy early starting materials and, and you know, and you know, but we buy products like Penji from uh, from China. So um, there is definitely an impact, but the impact is relatively nominal. Um, certainly re relatively nominal at this point, and there will be a sm uh, small impact in the coming quarters based on the total cost of goods. Okay, but if you can just let me know the uh, exposure to Chinese uh, raw material, that would be helpful. Quantify it somewhere. And in some ballpark. We take this offline. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Maybe we can take the last question. So, uh, sure. Due to time constraints, we'll be able to take one last question. The last question is from the line of Vishal Manchanda from Nirmal Bang. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, on pro, yeah, just wanted to understand whether litigation is uh, an hurdle to your launch or you could uh, launch after 30 months exclusivity expires. No, we have already uh, settled with the brand. So litigation will okay. not be a hurdle. Okay, and uh, so it will be kind of, uh, it will be a full launch or there, there are restrictions like limited quantity as they had settled with other players? Um, no, we can't talk about the details on the settlement, uh, but uh, we expect to really uh, be able to get 
uh, uh, a decent share. Okay, thank you. Okay, friends, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, hope you had uh, uh, all the answers. Uh, and uh, we look forward to meeting you again next quarter uh, and, uh, and share with you the performance uh, status of the company. Thank you, and bye for now.